So we're going from the world's sort of chief financial steward to a bevy of extremely senior figures from banking and different flavors of asset management uh, around the world. And I suspect we'll touch on some of the same things I'd discussed with Christy Lina. Uh, but Jane Fraser, David Hunt, Rishi Kapoor, Karen Carnion Tambor, and Robin Vince. You can all look at their bios, see you know how important they are. Um, you can also put your questions on the app. I encourage you to take out your frustration at my questions or giving me better ones to ask. Um, but given recent developments, I might start with you, Jane. What a That's surprise, okay. Stephanie, what a surprise. <laughs> um, as far as we know, you've not been involved in any of these uh, negotiations. I know you don't want to talk specifically about that, but just looking at the deal, certainly not bad for JP Morgan. Do you think it's good for the world? Look, I, no one likes to see a bank fail. Um, but that said, it's good to have really the, the last remaining major source of uncertainty resolved today. I think we, we should all feel pleased about that. Um, and then uh, look at some of the challenges ahead. When, when you take the step back and look at the structure of the US financial system, it's incredibly sound. Um, and uh, we think of the role that US banks uh, and many of you all play in the global financial system. Uh, we look at the, the different roles that different banks and institutions play in the US. It, it's, a, it's a very solid structure, and I think we've got to keep in mind this was a small handful of institutions um, that were poorly managed, um, as well as some macro stresses. And uh, we've got some important roles to play going forward. Should we be worried that it took so long? I mean, this was a bank that was supposedly rescued last month that has now had to be bought. Uh, Look, and a number of us, as I think everyone's aware, um, we're in a, a strong position to step in um, in a matter of 30 hours. The 11 largest banks in the States got together and put $30 billion into um, an institution to buy time to come up with um, the, right, the right solution. And I think that, that did its job. Um, in, in the grand scheme, the um, things moved relatively quickly, uh, particularly when Silicon Valley and Signature were happening. Um, but the whole point from uh, those of us who are involved in, in putting that 30 billion to work was, A, we were in a position to do so, which everyone should take a lot of comfort from, uh, but also uh, it, it, was do, it was to do exactly that, to buy time to get the right structure, the right pieces in, and, and get out of some of the stresses at the moment, because there was a confidence crisis for a few days there. You want to get through that um, and get to a, a better solution. And, now we, uh, we need to focus right, I, on what lies ahead. I promise I'm going to get to everyone else in one minute. There's one more follow-up. But, just, <laughs> but uh, you, like everybody else, has said these are isolated cases. We know that these are specific business models, risky business models that led to these issues. But a digital bank run is something that could now happen to any yeah. bank. You've said yourself it's a game changer. Mm -hmm. And making money from not passing on short-term rate increases by the Fed is something that all banks do. So. Stepping back from the specifics of these cases, would you say there are still general aspects of the business model for banks, how they make money in a digitized world that are, there are now questions about? Oh, I, I think the, the core question is the structure of the US banking system where you've got different banks playing different roles is a very important one. It's a very sound one. Um, it works. Uh, and it is the envy of the world. It's not perfect, but it is, uh, it is the envy of the world. I've worked in different uh, financial systems all over the world, and this, this one is uh, it's pretty darn good. Um, you're absolutely right. The, what changed here was the speed with, with which consumer deposits moved. Interestingly, what we found, and I'm sure Robin will talk to the same thing, um, the, the corporate deposit base, the institutional deposit base is more sticky in a digital world because it's embedded, a lot of the different services provided are embedded into the risk management system, into the technology systems, into payroll, um, uh, the, the procurement systems of our client base, and that actually makes it stickier. Whereas when we've looked at the consumer deposits, they move much faster, and I think that's certainly one of the things we're all, we've all been 
uh, looking at and taking note on. Well, actually, Robin, I was going to ask you, I mean, you had reminded me that along with all the other things that BNY Mellon is, is big in, um, you're the world's biggest custodian. Um, so coming out of these bank failures in the US, are you seeing broader concerns? What's the response been from your clients? So um, you know, one of the things that Jane touched on, I think, is very important, which is the, the nature of the way that money is just integral to the operating of client accounts. We, we don't think uh, of the world in sort of insured and, and uninsured. That's a, that's a retail construct, and I understand why the shorthand exists. Uh, but we really think about operating uh, required deposits. And so ultimately, what's sticky is what matters in terms of uh, the deposit uh, franchise. And you know, two thirds of our deposits as, as uh, the world's largest custodian, as a company that touches 20% of all investable assets in the world, are operational because they are very uh, key uh, to ultimately how uh, the, the cl our clients need to prosecute their business. So whether it's a payment or whether it's they're accruing money to make a coupon uh, or, or other things that are just in inextricably linked with the prosecution of their business. Because we're a platforms business as a company, and, uh, and, and many of the other large uh, banks in the United States are as well. And so having invested in the resilience, we view, by the way, resilience to be a commercial uh, attribute. And I think we've seen that borne out over the course of the past couple of, uh, couple of months, that resilience really does matter. It could be technological resilience around one's platforms. It could be resilience of one's balance sheet. But those have really become commercial uh, attributes, and our clients see the power of that. And I think we've seen, with the, with the strength of the US banking system, I think we've really seen that borne out. David. So so I, I think there is a little bit of a tendency to kind of breathe a sigh of relief on, on mornings like this and think we got, we got through that. Actually, we're just starting. Um, the implications for uh, the U.S. economy and more broadly are now going to be pretty profound from what's happened and what may happen going forward. First of all, we're going to see a real ratcheting up of regulation in the banking system, particularly on many of these regional lenders. And uh, I think everybody's been uh, kind of expecting that. And I think that will be, uh, at the end of the day, quite constraining on their capital base. And what that will do is that is going to further hinder uh, the supply of credit that's going into the economy. And I think that uh, we are going to see now a real slowing uh, that begins to happen to aggregate demand because of uh, uh, the decre decrease in, uh, in the supply of credit that's coming in. Um, and the main catalyst for a lot of that, unfortunately, I think is going to be directed at an area that's already under pressure, which is real estate debt, where a lot of these folks have, uh, have put in very important players. Uh, there's already uh, been, uh, for various reasons we can talk about in real estate, a lot of pressure in that area, and this is only going to be uh, exacerbating of that. Now, taking a step back from all of that, uh, obviously PGM is one of the largest private credit providers. Um, we have managed about $100 billion in, uh, in private credit. And over time, obviously, the non-bank lenders have been taking share from the banks. Um, and that is only going to accelerate now with uh, these failures and the rise in uh, the real regulation on, uh, on many of these regional banks. So I think that when you look at private credit as an asset class, and many of the institutional investors here, you're going to see non-bank uh, financials take even more share from the banking industry going forward. That's interesting. So, Rishi Kapoor, I should, uh, I should bring you in. I mean, the, on the commercial real estate, we've heard, in fact, Charlie Munger said recently, there's a lot of agony going on uh, in there. We are seeing a lot of question marks about commercial real estate, but it's, it, it was uh, interesting what David said about uh, non-banks. Do you agree with all that? So, actually, you know what uh, Charlie said in his... Um in his address yesterday, I think was along the lines of there are certain sectors within real estate that are more vulnerable than others. And I, and I think that differentiation is a little important uh, over here because uh, wiping the whole wall with the same brush is uh, not going to uh, be relevant. Um, no doubt that the second and third order effect of the banking sector fallout in the US in particular is going to cause uh, constraining uh, of financial conditions and lending to the commercial real estate sector in particular, which was 50% plus from the regional banking system, is definitely going to be limited. Ironically, it kind of facilitates the Fed's ultimate objective of a tightening of financial conditions leading to a, 
reduction in demand, et cetera. But when you go back to the real estate space, broadly speaking, and bifurcate it between the residential real estate, right, which is much more open to annual resets of rental income and therefore keeps space with inflation in a much more timely, uh, timely manner, what we are finding in our own portfolio is that the rental increase that we see and the increase in net operating income is actually more than offsetting the cost of debt service. So as long as you have the right financing structure in place with the right tenor attached to it, you can actually ride out this, this period for some period of time focusing on operating imbr operational improvements, rental increases, and then try and capture a better cap rate on the way out with the hopefully lower interest rate environment. Same thing you know, for a different reason driven by secular trends regarding nearshoring, reshoring of supply chains. You see exactly the same in the uh, industrial logistics warehouse space. And Charlie specifically said office and retail. That's where you see the pressure. And that pressure on office and retail is manifesting itself in some degree of dislocation, particularly on the CMBS um, uh, space. Frankly, that's as much an opportunity as it is a challenge for all of us to, to contend with. Because as David was referring to, in the current environment where bank lending is naturally constrained and valuations of certain sectors within the real estate market are lower with cost of debt service higher and imminent refinancing needs uh, coming up, players like us that can provide that solution-based financing you know, uh, facility to borrowers that are looking for some degree of relief you know, some time to tide out the current pinch that they are uh, facing are actually going to be highly sought after. <laughs> the challenge is that there is still a bit of a bid offer spread, right? So transaction volumes have dramatically slowed down uh, as a consequence. But over the course of the next 12, 18 months, we'll find a new equil equilibrium. And uh, it actually is good, good for players like us to step into the breach where you know, everybody else has vacated the space. So I'm not, I'm not overly pessimistic. I'm not optimistic either. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being pragmatic about it. Well, I'll give it, I know Jane yeah. wants to give it. No, I, I think Rashid's making a very important point. We can't make broad sweeping statements on commercial real estate here. Um, when we look at it, it, it is primarily in the office space, but we've equally got to get targeted there. It's the return to office phenomenon that's driving it. We're not talking about the local doctor's office. We're not talking about um, all of the office space either. And a lot of the, re the areas where I'm, I'm more worried about is Third Avenue and East, for example, in New York City. <laughs> yeah. um, and buildings, you look and go, yeah, probably not the one that's going to get converted into a residential property easily. But for a lot of the, the regional players and others, that's not the real estate they're in. And that re the real estate we're more worried about is more at the bottom, bottom end of the stack of CMBS. And that's already priced in at 50% or whatever it may be. So I, 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 it will be a stress point for sure. Um, I think we're all on our risk committees, other pieces looking at it. Um, but, but let's not make the sweeping statements to Rishi's point here. And let's not tarnish all the regional and small banks as having an enormous problem. This is not the world financial crisis. This is not the savings and loan crisis. There will be stress, but let's be targeted where it is. And I'm sure some of you will make quite a bit of money from it. <laughs> Well, it certainly shows with Charlie Munger using words, throwing words like agony around, it gets people very yeah. riled up. Um, Karen, we've talked, we were already talking about bits of uh, a, what has been described certainly as a slow motion credit crunch, hitting mm. quite a lot of, certainly small businesses, we're seeing real estate issues. Is that, do you think that was, we had been fundamentally underestimating how that was gonna work through the system? Do you think the Fed understands how serious that's gonna be? Well, I think that what's happening now, the type of credit crunch we're seeing is roughly what you would expect if you tighten as aggressively as the Fed has tightened. And so we're coming off of some of the fastest tightening we've seen in decades. We really haven't lived through such an aggressive tightening in a very, very long time. And when that happens, 
something is bound to break. You don't always know exactly what will break, but you know that you're purposely making financial conditions tighter, making real rates higher. You're, you're trying to slow things down and handle inflation. And I wouldn't have predicted this is exactly where it would have hit, but it's certainly a tightening in credit conditions, I think, is what was intended to, to be engineered. I think where we are now is that that tightening's occurred. It's kind of making its way through the system. We don't know exactly what the next shoes to drop are, but we know that it's still kind of flowing through and making its way through money and credit in the economy. And there don't have to be extreme downsides of you know, anything like the savings and loan size for it to be meaningful in terms of slowing the economy. But you also have a lot of self-sustaining momentum at the same time. What's happening in financial markets in turn, though, is that because partly because of this you know, kind of stress that occurred around Silicon Valley and so on, what's priced into the markets is now kind of asymmetric and, in my view, prime for disappointment because a significant easing to reverse the tightening is now already in the price. And so you're looking at financial assets and they basically tell you there's going to be a slowing of the economy, but not a very big one, you know, pretty mild, pretty modest, not really a big deal. But the Fed is going to significantly ease into that because inflation is going to stop being a problem so quickly. And to me, that's a prime for disappointment situation because if the economy doesn't slow, the Fed really can't afford to ease all that much or really risks its credibility on inflation. And I don't think inflation is going to come down so rapidly that the inflation, that the Fed can just stop worrying at all about sticky inflation. It's certainly going to come down, but not necessarily to levels that you know, everyone's kind of hoping it will. And if the economy does slow more significantly and the credit crunch becomes more serious, well, what usually helps the markets is the Fed easing, and that's already in the price. It's already expected, <laughs> so you can pretty much only get just disappointment. Just, yeah, I mean, but part of this, you know, there's a worst case, worst scenario, at least a more challenging scenario for asset allocators, yeah. which has actually been highlighted by a Bloomberg economist, which is a sort of stag, stagflation environment, where you still have the stoggardly high above a target inflation at the end of the year, but you have growth having slowed to maybe 1% or less. You know, do we know how to al allocate a portfolio for that? Do we know how to consider the implications of that in the capital markets? Karen, I guess, first. Well, I think that when you look at that environment, which I would broadly say it's the environment where central banks are actually very constrained because they have this problem that they can't get what they want on growth and inflation at the same time, it tends to be the worst possible environment for holding assets. And we haven't been in that environment in decades. And as investors, there are not a lot of incredible options because all financial assets do worse when you have to keep real interest rates high to deal with this and you don't get sort of a great growth outcome. What's really poor about most investor portfolios for that situation is that they have very low inflation protection. So there's not much you can do about the fact that you can't get the Fed easing that you're used to, but there is more you can do about the lack of inflation protection. Yeah. David. So, I, so I, I just building on, on Karen's comments, I, re I really do think that the market at the moment is uh, you know, overly optimistic in terms of what's been put into the price. On the other hand, that's an advantage for those of us that are in active management because we can certainly bet on the other side of that. Um, you know, I think that the market fundamentally underestimates the strength of the U.S. economy yeah. and therefore is underestimating both how high rates will need to go and how long they will need to stay there to finally bring uh, inflation down. The stagflation scenario that you referred to, I would say, is not an equilibrium situation. It ends generally badly um, and in a recession. So that we might have that for a period of time, but that's not kind of an end state that you can, you can go to. I actually think, though, the reason that uh, you know, many risk asset uh, allocators have stayed on the sidelines is not because of this scenario uh, around, around recession. It's actually around the belief that markets are pretty good at pricing in uh, economic market cycles. You know, we'll, we'll absolutely get more data in this and the market will reprice. But what the market does very poorly is to price in low tail event, uh, you know, non-rational uh, actions. And I would just give you two that we're looking at right now. Um, one of them is what happens in Ukraine um, as Putin is more and more cornered. And does he take a much more radical way out, which you could argue is not rational, but he may do anyway. Um, and the second one uh, happens in the delightful town of Washington, D.C. So the markets love to believe that, uh, you know, congressmen at the end of the day will be rational. And at 11.59, we will absolutely, you know, reach an agreement because that's what rational people would do. But what if that's not true this year? What if there are enough uh, politicians at this point 
who are not so sure that actually putting the credibility of the U.S. government wouldn't be worth the political gain. And so I just think that the market at this point doesn't handle these kinds of situations well. And for those of us in our risk committees, that's what we're pushing on, and it's what we're working with our clients on more than we are actually on some of the recession scenarios. Actually, just as you mentioned the debt ceiling, I'm interested in when it gets to the point, you know, there's a, certainly my colleagues in D.C., the, the, the problem seems to be that no one's panicking because they know that they, they sort of feel they know that ultimately there'll be a deal, but that's why no one's trying to do a deal because no one's panicking. Right. When do you guys start picking up the phone or who do you think would be the right people to start picking up the phone for this particular Republican caucus? Jane, I know you, I'm sure you have a very <laughs> deep insight into the Republican caucus. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> um, we don't pick up the phone and tell the politicians what to do. We stay out of the politics, but we do lay out what are the consequences of this. And I think this year, we've, last week, three times the number of calls and the week before from investors who are nervous. They're nervous about this earlier. We're seeing stress in, in some signs of, you know, in the prices of treasuries. Oh, CDS already at um, very unusual levels this early on. Uh, so the conversations are more around, you know, deep concern about it. If you get down to it, I think the market's going to have a serious sense of humor failure. If there's a couple of coupons that are missed, um, you know, you can get by with that. But this starts very quickly to have serious economic consequences for consumers, for investors, and frankly, the credibility uh, of the U.S. financial system. This time feels different. It's more worrying. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think just um, picking up on um, the topic we were um, discussing earlier, you know, the, the set of financial conditions that we are likely to be facing and that we need to incorporate into our asset allocation decisions, what is e equally important is the tenor that we attach to that assessment, right? The horizon over which we anticipate, for instance, a slower growth environment or a higher rate environment, et cetera. And particularly for people like us that are deploying capital into private markets, where there is an inherent illiquidity embedded into our investment decisions, but also a long-term, the luxury of a long-term investment horizon attached uh, to it, it's doubly important for us to incorporate a tenor with the financial conditions that we anticipate. Now, for, for us, we are using a 444 regime, you know, where we say baseline, expect a relatively modest low level of unemployment at around 4%, inflation running higher than central bank you know, targets at around 4%, but also interest rates higher than the widely accepted acknowledged neutral rate at about 4%. With that 444 mindset, what you are really looking to capture is where is the macro backdrop supported by long-term secular trends that will inevitably offset the noise that you're going to witness in the, in the interim period. Stephanie, I'll tell you some anecdotally. I, th this morning, I looked at the closing price of the S&P 500 last night. Mm -hmm. It was almost I, exactly the same as 52 weeks ago, right? Exactly the same. So we were sitting here in this conference, this panel, and actually mm -hmm. I should take a, a second to remember our fellow panelists from last year who sadly passed away, Scott Minard, may God rest his soul in peace. But um, it's exactly the same. Now, the intervening 52 weeks, you know, we've gone through, as Kristalina <laughs> was pointing it's out, long you know, three bank failures <laughs> over here, one major systemic bank failure in Europe, you know, the meltdown in the UK with the, with the disaster yep. with the budget, and so on and so forth. Who could have imagined that that journey results in an outcome 52 weeks later where you're exactly where you started? And that is the essence for us of being able to pick the right spots, the right sectors going full, full circle back, the right secular trends, whether it is you know, focusing on need-based investments rather than want-based investments sector-wise, whether it is backing the inexorable push towards digitalization and the adoption of AI, whether it's the reshoring and nearshoring of supply chains, fueling a big investment spurt uh, in logistics and local manufacturing and so on. And that, I think, trumps much of the short-term noise around, is it going to be 1% growth this year, right? Yeah. From an investment capital allocation uh, perspective. Karen, Karen, sorry, do you want to come back on, everyone's talking through the implications of your observation, but um, 
it goes, slightly get the fact that the S&P is exactly the same level rather goes to your point that maybe there's a bit too much optimism still built in. Yeah, I think that the problem is that when you get paradigm shifts that really change the nature of the market environment, it takes a long time for that to get fully digested by investors. And so you have a real shift that's occurred from a world we lived in from 1980 or so that inflation was just constantly pulled lower by a variety of secular factors to now a world where that's no longer true. And it's a mix of things, whether it's the fact that for years, constantly you had spending to outsource what you're doing and make it cheaper. So every dollar a business spent actually went and was deflationary, even though we're spending money because they went and lowered the prices of what they were making that way and could outsource to poorer countries and so on and so forth. And where it was the fact there was massive deregulation and less antitrust work, but just a lot of deflationary things that took place at the same time to where well, that's basically behind us. Not only is every good we touch already globalized, everything's already made at the cheapest possible location, but now there's a massive pressure the other way, and I think it's the biggest pressure to do non-economic spending we've ever seen. I mean, this is like a wave of spending that needs to happen that's not there to lower prices. It's there to make us resilient, which means Double do your supply chains. That means basically go produce somewhere more expensive rather than the cheapest possible place because you need to be resilient. It means decarbonization, which long term is great for the economy, but in the immediate term, you're not saving any money by decarbonizing whatever it is you're doing in your business. And it means defense spending because of concerns about national security risk. So these are massive, massive non-economic spending flows that move us to a world where you can't go and you know stop antitrust one more time, stop regulation one more time, and you're not going to go and get you know that kind of decline from cheaper and cheaper things coming online. Now you have a world where inflation, kind of neutral inflation, is both more volatile because you have put things pulling the other direction, and just higher. And so. I think it takes time for markets to digest that a world of higher inflation is one that basically means higher risk premiums because you have to sort of handle these shifts, structurally higher real rates because you have higher non-economic spending that sort of has to happen. And I think it's taking time for the markets to fully digest how constrained central banks are going to be relative to the last 30, 40 years where every time there was a tiny murmur of a problem, you could just lower rates, print money. There was no concern on the other side. There was nothing constraining you. That shift is going to take time to fully digest. And no one working for most of you has really lived through anything like this. They've had the environment that you just described is what they've been used to. But Robin, I want you to take us to the rest of the world because we've been partly by design, but we've been pretty US focused and California focused at the beginning. Does, when you look at, does the rest of the world now weirdly look safer than some of the issues we're seeing in the US or is that is the slow motion credit crunch is all of that coming for them soon, certainly in Europe? You know, it, it's, a, it's interesting, Stephanie, because uh, just, just sort of picking up on the point that Karen was just mentioning, I was with a, a large German CEO just last week uh, talking about some of these exact issues. And as we went round the world looking at where they wanted to put their investment dollars to work, the U.S. just stands out as the best uh, marginal opportunity for a whole bunch of reasons. And so we've talked about some of the struggles uh, here. So obviously, we've got to get through the debt ceiling. And that's a very, very important topic. And we talked about it being a very important tale, but we spent uh, all, all of 30 seconds talking about it. So, but, but that is important that we get through that. We've talked about the, the downsides of inflation. But some of those same issues that, um, that Karen was just talking about, those are, in fact, magnets for people to becoming and investing here in the US. We've got the deepest capital market in the world. We've got this huge economy. We've got energy independence, certainly for the transition. Uh, and that is an incredibly attractive thing, notwithstanding all of the, the political ups and downs that we may have in the US on a relative basis compared to some of the other choices, that if you're a European manufacturing CEO right now, where do you want to make the investment in your net marginal plant? Do you want to diversify elsewhere into Europe where you still have the same critical energy uh, dependency challenge that you'd have if you were in your home base uh, in Europe? Or do you want to go further, further east with some of the, the various different geopolitical challenges that that might entail? Or do you want to come to the deepest capital market 
uh, in the world with a, with a very vibrant labor force that actually wants to get on and to drive forward. And I think there's a lot of calculus that we see from our clients uh, as they evaluate the US. We have the world's largest depository receipts franchise. And so that is an issuer services capability where we help companies to list in foreign markets. And we see that draw of the US capital markets from those clients. I, I, I think like all of us, we spend a fair amount of our time on a plane at the moment. Where are the bright spots we're seeing around the world? So um, Japan. Um, I, we've seen tremendous inbound as well as outbound interest in Japan. Um, it's, uh, it's really come out with a lot of vibrancy, not without its challenges, but uh, that's one market that from our perspective of inbound investment um, from multinationals, but also the Japanese looking out. Another area would be India, is another real bright spot that we're seeing. Um, our commercial banking franchise there works with a lot of mid-market companies. They're impressive. Um, on the technology innovation, on the green supply chain, um, and three and a half trillion economy versus 17 trillion in China, um, and they're the same, uh, same population now. Uh, that smacks of a, an opportunity there. And then another big shift, I think, coming out of uh, the pandemic and, and all the dynamics that we've been talking about is the Middle East. You know, there's a huge amount of flows that we're now seeing diversifying from, um, from a focus on the West to the East. Um, I think the um, rumors of Hong Kong's demise are somewhat overdone. Um, it feels like it will be an important gateway into China. Um, and I've never seen so much activity between the Middle East um, and China um, and Hong Kong than we have in the last while. So I think some of these different flows, dynamics are changing. Um, this feels like it's uh, some pretty strong green shoots coming in Asia. It's nice to see them coming back. But what, what it certainly says is that globalization is uh, entering a very different, I think, and new, new phase. I mean, if historically a lot of that was about China, yeah. Um, uh, it's not that we're going to go into a kind of deglobalized world, mm -hmm. but we are going to have one where globalization is far more driven by regional flows yeah. um, and by many of these other big sources of capital like the Middle East, like India, like Japan. Um, so it's going to be, I think, much more varied. In addition, so much of uh, kind of globalization 1.0 was about trade uh, in goods. And I think we are now really seeing a lot of momentum behind services. And I think that's very exciting. I think we're gonna have a more stable globalization picture, which is also going to lead, uh, again, maybe not to the level of disinflation that we had from before, but it's certainly gonna add to uh, the economic uh, stability of, uh, of the West. The big question here, which maybe we should all turn to, is the question of China. And really, uh, do we end up with, which I think would be a huge difficulty for the world, in a decoupling of economies, or do we end up uh, you know, much more finding a way through uh, some of the political difficulties that we had? And I think that uh, you know, if you're the German CEO that uh, Robin was talking about or others, you know, that is your existential dilemma right now, particularly for many European countries. Yeah, and I'm struck when you say it could be a more stable globalization. I guess the stable stability in the sense of resilience, but possibly, to Karen's point, less efficient and way more subject to political interference and sort of geopolitical concerns. I, I don't know about the second part. I mean, I think, I think actually because there'll be many more countries involved in it, it may be more stable. It will not have the same disinflationary effect. I mean, China's great export, you know, over the last 20 years has been disinflation. And I do think that will come to a... Because it was a more point. efficient place to make things, and you're going to move into a less efficient place. You are, and so, so you are not going to have that benefit for sure. I think it's one of the reasons I believe in Karen's thesis that there'll be a higher uh, overall level of inflation going, going forward. But I do think that the new globalization 2.0 will be more stable and actually politically more durable because there'll be more countries involved. But I think also in tandem with this, what seems to be happening is that the deck chairs are getting arranged or rearranged in terms of the sources of capital and the destination of that capital. Historically, and Jane referenced this earlier, historically the Middle East was a big exporter of capital into the Western markets, US and Europe. And now we are seeing the Middle East being a lot more circumspect about having a more diversified portfolio yeah. of investments all over the world, particularly where you know, the, there is embedded growth over a projected long period of time that as, uh, as a capital allocator, you have to capture, specifically Asia, 
and other parts of the developing world, China and India uh, included, of course. But Middle East is also routing or redeploying a lot of its surplus capital into the Middle East, right? And that is new. And for the first time, and I, I bet you, if you were to have a show of hands even in this room, certainly a lot of people in this room have visited the Middle East in the last six months, I would, I would bet. But more importantly, the people in this room are looking at the Middle East not, not just from the perspective of can we capture Cap some capital, from the Middle East, but also from the perspective of, is there a capital deployment opportunity uh, in the Middle East, in partnership with incumbents over there, whether it's the, the big players, the sovereign wealth funds, or the other uh, embedded asset managers, et cetera. Same thing for India, right? Exactly the same thing is playing out in India. For the longest of times, a lot of private capital investment in India was driven by foreign investor flows, right? But you're seeing a much more vibrant domestic uh, market for domestic investment into the private markets in India, whether it's private equity, credit, mm -hmm. real estate, the entire uh, landscape. So I think if you take a step back and you are uh, somewhat objective, neutral uh, investment platform or capital allocator, you can't ignore the top five economies in the world, right? And China is number two <coughs> by a mile compared to numbers three, four, and, and five. So China is clearly going to get, and it's going to need, and is going to deliver a return on some element of capital flows. Whether they emanate from the US or not is obviously um, you know, going to be subject to a lot of uh, political uh, considerations that's, rather than that, anything else. That's an interesting distinction you make because you know, that's obvious, the debate we might have had a year or two ago <coughs> was about whether China was investable. And you know, we've certainly seen Premier Li Zhang do a sort of charm offensive to uh, foreign investors saying we will continue on the path, we'll continue open it. Are you, are you buying it? What's the, what's, the, what's the path into China now? Because it's more complicated than in the days where we just said it was gonna move to an ap appropriate level of allocation. Not just China, I think China and Hong Kong. And particularly if you're, you know, for us, given the fact that uh, the Middle East is an important hub of operations for us, we see both China and Hong Kong making a very determined push to establish and forge very deep relationships with the entities, with the institutions, with the investor community in the Middle East on a bilateral basis, not just you know, come and invest in, in China, but also partner with, with us, Chinese entities and Hong Kong entities, because we want to invest in the Middle East. Oh. And that is very, very new. It's frankly quite, Quite unique. And I, I think you would find most of us, and I'd be interested in others' views, that on the ground, those of us that operate in China, actually uh, the mood is very constructive, helpful, and, and uh, you know, we're finding certainly that, that uh, you know, relationships with regulators and others are quite constructive. So there is a little bit of a, a kind of through the looking glass feeling when you see what the politicians are saying and how we actually feel it on, on the ground. One, one thing that I, I found fascinating the other day, we were looking at the, um, some of the data as we do a lot of the supply chain financing. Um, the big shift of the China Plus or uh, where else has moved, say, into Vietnam, into Malaysia, into other parts, particularly in the tech sector and others where there's concern on the geopolitics to Chinese-owned companies. Um, so what we've been seeing is a lot of the Chinese companies have have their domestic operation and we've seen more of the multinationals as well looking at mm -hmm. how do we do China for China but then there's the outside China but it's and the, these suppliers are they're world class and this is challenges the quality the efficiency the scale of what is being produced by these companies ones that it is hard to be competitive if you're not tapped into but it was a, I, I thought it was oh, a really and their interesting inputs are loss. all coming from China, so it's yes. relevant. So it's yeah. the, they're, yeah. they're managed, it's the China Plus is a country, not, a, um, not the domicile of the owner. Robin, um, it, does, it feels like we're talking about a slightly different global capital market, though, in which, to Rishi's point, it's, there's a sort of regional aspect. It's not necessarily the big cross-border flows. Um, how, how do you see the sort of international allocation? So um, we touch 20% of the world's uh, assets across our various different platforms, and so we certainly have a good visibility into some of the flows 
uh, that are going on uh, at the moment. You know, I think we've covered a lot of the different topics on this panel uh, in terms of what's going on. You know, I talked a little bit about uh, the flow uh, into the US, which we actually see, uh, and, and others have talked about the flow into, uh, into some of the other countries. I think one of the lessons that we draw from all of this is that having big global platforms uh, certainly as a US-based institution is incredibly powerful as an advantage. Um, you know, we started off the conversation talking about some of the banking stresses in the US, but one of the things that we've seen is that US banks are well positioned across the globe uh, to be able to actually, whether it's the import or the export uh, that needs to be done across capital markets flows, that we're, we really are extremely well positioned given all of the investments that have occurred into the US banking system over the course of the past 15 years since the global uh, financial crisis. And as a result, we see US banks having these tremendous capabilities, whether it's some banks in the M&A space, whether it's in a case like us uh, in the payment space, uh, in creating the ability to, to, to to move capital around the world, helping clients, whatever it is that they may happen to be. That's how we really think of ourselves. So we don't describe ourselves as a technology company, but we are a platforms company, and those big global platforms are gonna be a competitive advantage, irrespective of whether the world is a little bit more regional uh, or global. Karen, did you want to? I think that for most investors in this room, the reality is our portfolios are so U.S. and Europe dominated, and mostly U.S. dominated. I mean, at this point, the U.S. is 70 plus percent of global market cap and equities, that China is the biggest possible source of diversification that's available to anyone in this room. And the more the conflict kind of hardens, the more China actually becomes more and more a little bit its own universe. <laughs> and own monetary policy, own fiscal policy. They're a place that doesn't have the inflationary problems I was talking about before. So the diversification benefits, I think will keep being appealing to people as where else can you put your capital and get something different than what you're gonna get. At the same time, the concern that regulation is gonna be much tougher, and I think investors don't even know if it's from the US side or the Chinese side, but that from one side or the other, it'll be challenging to hold a Chinese allocation as a US-based or European-based investor have obviously grown very significantly. And so you're in a place where, you know, being able to hold up from a national security perspective, a lot of people just don't wanna be in those crosshairs, so the benefit and the cost are kind of rising at the same time. And the bigger thing is that the fact that the conflict with China has kind of hardened has just seeped so deeply into policymaking that every country, but the U.S. kind of as a leader, is, is trying hard to both become competitive and reduce vulnerability on China at the same time. And that's really creating different types of winners and losers than we've seen before. Any country, and you know, Jane was talking before about different regional um, you know, neighbors of China, any country that can be a China substitute is benefiting from those flows. And then within the US and Europe, anybody who can benefit from all the explosion in industrial policy, all the things that we wanna be doing to be competitive with China, now that we've kind of gotten over this almost allergy to doing industrial policy because, wait a minute, we're not supposed to be picking winners and losers here, we're supposed to be just having a competitive system, pick it on itself. Now that we're doing all this industrial policy to be competitive with China, that's really changing the winners and losers within sectors. So you can't really ignore how that force is you know, shaping both which countries and which sectors and which companies are winners and losers, and the diversification benefit of China will still be the main thing pulling the other way from all the fears. But yeah, I really, I really think that um, too uh, few people listened to our national security advisor Sullivan uh, last fall when he fundamentally changed the U.S. policy on technology. Um, and he moved their, our technology from trying to stay, you know, one generation ahead of foundational technologies like AI, like quantum computing, like semiconductors, to a different objective. And that objective was actually to ensure that the U.S. had as large a lead as possible in these foundational technologies. And the result of that was a uh, list of export controls that we've never quite seen the like of before. It uh, resulted in legislation which has created substantial subsidies to uh, American firms uh, for the investment in these technologies. And it's absolutely created a larger void at this point um, between the U.S. and China. China is now uh, you know, rapidly, obviously, responding to a lot of that. But I think that that is the kind of battleground uh, at the moment, which we should all be watching. And to Karen's point, it really does, the more the economies begin to d diverge in these, 
the more important it will be for global investors to actually own Chinese companies, Chinese technologies, to capture uh, the growth that's going to happen in China, which almost all of us believe in over the, over the medium to if long If you're time. allowed to. Yeah. Yeah. I, I you might not, in the end, be allowed to. You could be subject to any number of... You do, and, 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 and those of us up here probably a year ago couldn't spell Cepheus. And uh, you know, all of a sudden, we've got a whole new set of uh, you know, controls on how we actually uh, invest and, and where we can invest. But I think to Jane's point earlier, there are ways with China Plus to begin to play a lot of these trends which don't involve the direct investment into, into China. I think the other piece that we, you know, we, we skirted around a little bit, but it gets the heart of it, you know, the next decade is going to be a massive transformation because of generative AI. Um, a, the, the destruction of some of our middle classes and, um, is, and the, the wealth in there is, is worrying because the speed of this transition, and it's not, this is not blockchain. This is really completely changing industries and, and work as we know it that's coming. And it always takes a bit longer than you expect, but when it happens, it happens really quickly. And I think that's where so much of the attention focus is going to come. Um, and it's not just going to be what the technology does, it's who can really be in the arms race to speed that into transforming industries and how do we cope with the social side of it. Um, and uh, the US is pretty good at that. China's been pretty good at that on a very different model. But that, I think, is going to be quickly the big question that we'll all have to turn to, as well as Green Revolution, other pieces as well. But to your point, I mean, those, that is a microeconomic force, which probably in most ways would have been supporting closer integration, deeper globalization. And yet, mm -hmm. On layered on top of that is all that you've been talking about, all the uneconomic reasons why you might be, yeah. you know, money will be flowing into things that are not economic, that don't, aren't necessarily the most efficient solution, but will make money for investors. So this is like a crazy calculus that you're going to be making over the next few years. How do you navigate that? When there's sort of the rand of the deus ex machina of government is sort of there any time. Anybody else? Who so, so, so <laughs> I, I, I think that the, that will be one of the major reasons that continues to drive the overall trend that we've seen toward more private assets. Um, because I do think that private assets uh, and investors in private assets are the people that are going to take the longer term view uh, that's necessary to make money out of some of those. And whether that's green infrastructure or whether that's uh, private credit or whether that's the growth in, in international lending, um, you were going to see uh, private markets continue to grow as a share of investors' allocations. Now, in the past 15 years, a lot of that has been private equity, and I still think private equity will continue to grow and offer good returns. But in the future, I think actually we're going to see more and more growth coming from private credit, from infrastructure, and from secondaries, and probably with higher rates, a little bit less from uh, private, private equity. But as a portfolio, and as a global portfolio, that will continue to grow as investors' uh, allocations. That's interesting. Well, I'm sure Rishi, I suspect, would agree with that. But I just wonder, does other people agree with that basic view? Because that's quite a shift, especially when you think of the sort of cult of liquidity Right. Wanted to have it instant is. liquidity. It's it's rejecting that. Do you think that's right? I mean, do you think it's it's going to be an era of, of private markets? I think we are. I think it's been an era of private markets. Meaning, if you look at what investor portfolios look like, they have shifted massively towards into privates. And if anything, right now they're dealing with how different how different the pace is of marking mark to market on the assets is, what it's like to actually live with illiquidity. A lot of investors shifted in and then never really experienced what illiquidity is like, what it actually means to have part of your portfolio not mark as fast as the rest and have to fund from one to the other. So if anything, we're kind of at a, I think, pausing point where investors are for the first time dealing with what that's really like. The average investor portfolio has gotten extremely equity heavy, particularly private equity heavy, very liquid and extremely US heavy because there's been just you know, a couple decades now where US firms just ate everything because of tech dominance. And usually when you have shifts this long, it's much easier to prime you to go the other direction because once you have a few decades where capital all shifts in one way, it can only keep going so far. And so 
I think you could go further into the liquids, but man, there's already a lot in the liquids. And then what I feel more confident in is the U.S. dominance of portfolios is kind of at the edge. You can't have more U.S. dominance in portfolios than already exists. And so capital can only stay where it is or really shift to other places. You can't be more U.S. dollar based. And usually when you have companies win for so long, that gets priced into the next time. And so if you look at what it was like for the U.S. to win the last 20 years or so, that wasn't priced in at the beginning. And then you had this long period where U.S. tech especially sort of ate everything. Now that's completely priced in. So valuations in the U.S. are just worse than everywhere else because we're coming off of this period. We, we surveyed, just to build on that point for a second, we surveyed our data. We have a report that we call the ALTA report, which looks across the $47 trillion worth of data that we touch across our platforms. And if you just take one example of um, foundations and endowments, endowments, I mean, their commitment to the private markets has been over 60 percent uh, over the course of the past couple of years. It's ticked down very slightly uh, in the current uh, situation, but that's a very high concentration. Now, there's some of the longest dated investors going back to, uh, to Rishi's point earlier on. The, the duration of your liabilities matters a lot when you're making asset selection. So they've got very, very long-term viewpoints. So they can afford to be some of the most concentrated investors in the world. Uh, but that's a very, very high percentage when you actually think about uh, a commitment to private markets. I think some of the other pieces you've got to look at is uh, the democratization of private equity. Is going to, I mean, that's going to be very, very critical in how we make sure that the savings get deployed, um, the asset allocation goes right under this world. What's the level of transparency that's required? Because we talk about the strength of the Western system because of, as Kristalina was talking about, the rule of law, the different institutions we've got in place, and some of the checks and balances and protections. And so how do we make sure that that keeps up with it? But uh, I think for all of us, we'll be looking at uh, how do we make sure that this becomes available to all and the system uh, continues if, to evolve If I were a regulator, it. that might strike fear into my soul. <clears throat> the idea of democratizing, you know, every time we democratize a form of investment, it tends to burn a lot of people. Not if you don't put the right guardrails around it. I mean, I think that a number of us have seen what happened in the, the crypto market without protections and other pieces put in place. And therefore, many of us, banks did not play in that. Um, but when you do put the right safeguards uh, in place, investor protections, the right regulatory frameworks that don't crush innovation but actually enable it, um, then you have a very solid system. And I think that's, that's where we want to be encouraging the forward-looking, let's not look at regulating an old system, but how do we make sure that the future one is, is robust um, and is thriving for the innovators, the investors, um, uh, and for all, it will be very important that works well. Can I just, because oh. we've had a few questions on the de-dollarization, and I don't want to get too bogged down in it, but since this is about ca global capital markets, a big feature of global capital market has been over the years, the big surpluses of Saudi, of all the you know, countries in Asia, being recycled through US treasuries. And we do seem to be seeing a de-treasurization, which could get worse if we have a debt ceiling problem. Mm -hmm. You know, the low surpluses increasingly are not going through treasuries. How does that change that piece of that pretty fundamental piece of the world if we start to see people moving away from that? Well, one thing you see is that gold, silver are becoming more central. I mean, you have such regular inflows into these assets, and I think investors have kind of ignored them for a while, but they are both good inflation protectors and are the natural place for a central bank to go. And that's mostly where you have seen central banks go. It's not like there's an amazing currency alternative, right? Like central banks already have euros and no other currency is really ready for prime time. It's easy to overwhelm markets like Canada and Australia with even relatively small flows from a central bank perspective, trying to buy them. And so places like gold and silver, there's no fundamental price that gold kind of should be. It really just depends how much people seek protection and how worried they are about issues like what exploding debts are like, what debt ceiling events are like, what inflation is like. I mean, I, 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 ju I just think that every time we have one of these little crises, there's a question of de-dollarization and what about the role of, of, of it as a, the reserve currency. And I would just come back to all of the points that Robin made a moment ago about the strength of the U.S. economy. I see very, very low risk that we will actually move away from the U.S. There will be continued growth um, in, in, in some of the regional economies, for sure. But uh, I think that the strength of the U.S. economy means that the dollar will remain uh, the reserve currency for the foreseeable future.
Okay, final. We've obviously got the Fed. Just going back to the very, we've done the massive long term, super short term. Does, is this going to be the last interest rate rise this week? And do you worry about the implications if it's not the last one of this cycle? We, we, from, from what we're seeing on our credit card business, um, while the spending is coming down, the services side is incredibly strong. In the US, you still have a trillion dollars of excess savings sitting in the top two quintiles of depositors. And um, discovered that Americans like spending money and don't like stopping spending money. Um, and that's, that's driving you know, tightness in the labor market. And I think it's making, um, even though it is clearly softening, even though credit will tighten, it's making, I think, a resolute J will probably stay resolute in making sure that inflation is brought under control. We need him to, um, but I fear it's therefore a painful, a more painful time ahead than the market would like. I, I, David, oh, Robin, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I would add one thing, which is I think we should always be a little bit cautious about this, this point of predicting the top. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's an incredibly legitimate question. But I think that's what's gotten some market participants into trouble because they have tried to call the top. Yeah. And so, you know, when I joined the capital markets, Fed funds were six and a half percent, seemed pretty normal at the time. There are probably people in this audience who've seen numbers much higher than that. And so we should all, and I mean we being the capital markets, all participants, whether they be governments, whether they be private funds, whether they be banks, everybody has to prepare for the eventuality that, hey, maybe we did have a, uh, have a significant economic contraction, rates have to go down a lot, or maybe not, and inflation's sticky, and maybe it does have to go up higher than just the one more uh, rate rise. And I think being in the preparedness business and being able to withstand all of those outcomes is an incredibly important lesson that we should have all learned over the course of the past few months, whether it was what would happened in the UK last year, whether it's what happened in the events of March, um, but we should all be in the preparedness business. I, I would just uh, reiterate what I said before. I think that um, without a doubt, rates are going to be higher for longer than what's priced into the market right now. And as our chief economist likes to say, at higher rates, bodies will continue to float to the top over the course of the summer. <laughs> I think um, our view is that the Fed basically is in the gentlest but most firm manner possible telling us one thing and one thing alone. Scale back your hiring plans, scale back your spending plans. We need the economy and the demand to slow down, right? And they will not stop raising rates until they see that. Now, the pace of rate increases, is it going to be the same torrid pace as we saw in 2022? Highly, highly, highly unlikely. And also highly unlikely that we are going to see rate cuts later this year yeah. as, as being priced into the markets, apparently. So I don't know about the higher for longer, but I'll actually take a version of that, high for long. Mm. <laughs> Cameron, you can give the last word. It is hard for me to imagine the Fed lowering rates to the degree that is priced in without a much more serious economic downturn, and either one of those scenarios is not very good for markets. All right, I think that's a, that's a pretty good uh, place to end. I'm also struck by the sort of implication of this panel that the more we get decoupling, the more isolated China gets, the more you're going to want to invest there. I think on that basis, I, there's a North Korea fund I could send you, tell you the <laughs> fantastic <laughs> diversification benefits. I'm not sure the upside's great, but you know, we could do it anyway. Anyway, thank you very much to all the panel. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.